Welcome back to this week's BCPS TV Presents Math 6, the week of June 1st, and I'm your host, Ms. Barr. If this is your first week tuning in, I'm going to start by quickly giving a little information about myself. On your screen, you'll see a picture of me, Ms. Barr. I'm a secondary mathematics resource teacher for BCPS. My husband, Scott, who is a machinist for the DC Metro. My three sons, my two bonus sons. One is Bruce, a seventh grader at Arbutus Middle. Charlie, a third grader at Arbutus Elementary. And Kevin, our three and a half year old. Together, we love to eat pizza, go to the movies, play and watch baseball, and we very much enjoy the outdoors. What will we be learning this week in Unit 7 Statistics Standards? First, students will be able to recognize a statistical question as one that anticipates variability in the data related to the question and accounts for it in the answers. Second, we are going to be able to display and summarize numerical data in plots on dot plots and histograms. Again, look at the vocabulary words that are underlined. Those are going to be our main focus points throughout this week's lesson. Now let's think about it. I'm going to present some questions on your screen and I'd like for you to answer them aloud and then think about the type of answers that they yield. Here's your first question. How long does it take you to travel to school? How do you travel to school on most days? How tall are you without your shoes on? Do you have any siblings, yes or no? How many hours of sleep per night do you get when you have school the next day? And lastly, if you could meet a celebrity, who would you choose? I asked my bonus son, Charlie, his answers, and here we go. So Charlie, how long does it take you to get to school? Four to five minutes. How do you travel to school on most days? In a car. Okay. How tall are you without your shoes on? I would say about four one. And do you have any siblings? Yes. Okay. How many hours of sleep per night do you get? Ten to twelve. And if you could meet a celebrity, who would you choose? Kevin Hart. Okay. <laughs> He's hilarious. So what type of answers did they yield? Mostly numbers and a little bit of words. Okay, Mo most of the answers you had to give were numbers. Very good. Thank you for participating again this week. You're welcome. What is a statistical question? Well, according to our textbook, a statistical question is a question that has many different or variable answers. Let's look at some examples. Here's one. What is the most common color of the cars in the school parking lot? Here's another. What percentage of students in the school have a cell phone? And here's a third. Which kind of literature is more popular among students in the school? I'll give you a moment to think about what those might have in common. Now let's look at some non-examples. Here's the first. What color is the principal's car? Does Elena have a cell phone? And what kind of literature, fiction or nonfiction, does Diego prefer? Now I'm going to give you a moment to think about what those have in common. You should notice that the examples pertain to multiple people and multiple groups, such as the school, um, and cars in a parking lot, and it is going to give you a variety of different answers, such as different kinds of literature, different types of percentages, whereas the non-examples are very specific to one person and most likely would provide one answer. For example, what color is the principal's car? My car, for example, is red. <laughs> Not much to vary in that situation. Does Elena have a cell phone? That's a yes or no answer. Not much variability in that question. Let us try some together. I'm going to pose some st questions and we're going to determine if they are statistical or not. 
What is the favorite color of students in your school? This is a statistical question because it's asking a wide range of population of your school and specific colors could vary. How many centimeters tall is the door of your classroom? This is a non-statistical question because it's going to provide one answer. What kind of pet is most popular at your school? This is a statistical question. It's surveying people at your school, so there's a wide population as well as different answers could be accepted for the most popular pet. What is the average age of teachers at your school? This again is a statistical question because we are surveying the school and talking about average age of teachers, which again could range and vary. And what day of the week is today? That's a non-statistical question because it's just going to be one answer. I'm recording today and it's a Friday. There are no other answers to that question. Now it's your turn to show what you know about statistical questions. Remember, we are rooting for you. Okay, our last think about it for this week's lesson. On your screen is two data plots and the red triangle indicates the mean. Each data plot shows the ages of party goers at a party. So the question is, what do you notice and wonder about the distributions in the two dot plots? I'll give you a moment to think about that. And once again this week, we're welcoming back my bonus son, Bruce, who is going to answer these for us. So Bruce, looking at data set A, what do you notice? I notice that there's a lot of younger people and then there's a couple older people. Okay, and what do you wonder? Um, are the older people the parents? Okay, that's a good question. And data set B, what do you notice? That there's a wide range of people. And what do you wonder? Why there's so many people at the party. Okay, awesome. Thank you for participating this week. Let's investigate dot plots. A dot plot is a visual display in which each piece of data is represented by a dot above the number line. Here is an example. To the right, you will see numbers in a table. To the left, you will see the dot plot that represents those numbers and the frequency of those numbers from the table to the right. For example, if you look in the table, you will find that there are three zeros. And above the zero, you will see three dots. The same goes for every number displayed. As a visual representation, I can easily identify that five, six, and seven does not occur in my table, and that eight only occurs once. Dot plots are a data display that highlight the frequency of data. Now let's create a dot plot of our own. Let's imagine that the data at the top of your screen in the table represents the number of pets in a home. We are going to represent each of those numbers with a circle above the appropriate number on the number line. We're going to start with six and go across the top row. So I'm going to place my first point at six, and then I'm going to go and place another point at one, at one, another dot at five, five, two, three, and two. Now I'm going to move to the second row and place a dot over the one, now the two, the three, five, one, one, zero, and two. Now I have a visual representation of the data from the table on a dot plot. We're going to investigate how to describe the dot plot on the next slide, so follow along. We're going to now describe the spread, the center, and the shape of a dot plot. This image and screen is going to be filled with lots of vocabulary, so follow along with me. First, we're going to talk about the spread of a dot plot. The spread refers to the range or difference between the least and greatest values. In the case of this dot plot, we are looking at 8 minus 0, so the spread would be 8. 
We can also identify measures of center, such as mean and median. Mean and median and range might be affected by an outlier. We're going to refer to that in a moment. However, since we have the numbers and the frequency, we can simply identify the mean and median by writing out those numbers and determining those answers. The outlier is this point here at eight. It is a value, a data value much greater or less than the other data values. There is an algebraic way to identify the outlier that you'll learn in later grades. But today, we're just looking at the visual representation. We can also identify and describe the shape of a dot plot. The shape of this dot plot is not symmetrical, which means there are more dots on one side of the center than on the other side. Symmetrical means that a line can be drawn directly through the center to divide the figure into two parts that are mirror images of each other. Peaks are values with the highest frequency, so in this case, we would say that two is a peak, and clusters are groups of values occurring closely together. Lastly, we can identify the mode by looking at the frequency. The mode on our dot plot here is two since it occurs the most. And the words that are highlighted or bolded can describe the spread, the center, and the shape of the dot plot. Now let's create a dot plot as well as interpret and find variation in measures of center. So in the top of your screen, we have dogs and cats in our homes and a survey was given and the data is recorded. First, we're going to make a dot plot of the data. So I am going to show you what my dot plot would look like. I'm going to put a dot over the frequency of each number that occurs. So here is what my dot plot looked like. So when I read this, I read that there are four individuals who said that they do not own any cats or dogs in the house, which means if I look at the data, I will see um, the number zero occur four times. And the same thing with number one, it occurred four times. Number two looks like it occurred five. Three appeared four times. Four cats and dogs appeared once and five cats and dogs appeared twice. So the data in the dot plot matches the data in our um, box at the top of the screen. Now we are going to find the mean, median, range, and mode of the data so that we can use this to describe some of our data. Let's recall that the mean is the total number of cats and dogs added up divided by how many people were surveyed. So in this case, I added them all up and I got 40 and there were 20 data points. So when I divide those two, I got 20, which means the average number of cats and dogs that are in a home for this survey is two. Second, let's find the median. Remember that in order to find the median, we can put the numbers in order from least to greatest. I could also use the dot plot for this, but I find it easier to list them out. And then we're going to kind of cross out our numbers until we get to the center to find that median value. And in this case, you will see that it comes in between two and two, which is two. So the median for the set of data is two. Now let's find the range, which will tell us how our data varies. The range in this case is the greatest minus the least, and that's five minus zero, which is five. And lastly, the mode, which is the number that occurs the most, you can tell visually by the dot plot that it is two. Two is occurring five times, which is the most dogs and cats in the home. Lastly, we're gonna talk about how to describe the shape of the data distribution. Remember, we can describe the shape as either being symmetric or not symmetric. And in this case, when I look at it visually, I can tell that it is not symmetric. It is not a mirror image from a center point. So great job, let's continue. The next data display we're going to look at is a histogram. A histogram is a bar graph that shows the frequency of data within equal intervals. 
So if you look at the image presented on the right about starting salaries, you'll notice that it does look like a bar graph and it talks about frequency. However, the axis at the bottom, instead of a single digit or a category, is an interval of numbers. So histograms, like dot plots, are a data display that highlight frequency of data in intervals. So how do we create a histogram? Let's try with the problem on your screen. A bird watcher counts and records the number of birds at a bird feeder every morning at 9 a.m. for several days. The numbers and the data are indicated on your screen starting with 12 and ending with 7. I don't know about you, but 12, that's a lot of birds at a bird feeder. First, we're going to make a frequency table. So in this case, I'm going to divide the data into equal size intervals of four. The equal size intervals could change depending on your data. I'm going to use four for this problem. So you'll see that I started with one through four, five through eight, nine through 12, and 13 through 16. And then I recorded how many times a number showed up in that interval. Second, in order to make the histogram, intervals are listed along the horizontal axis. The vertical axis will show the frequency. So for each interval, you're going to draw a bar to show the number of days in that interval, just like a bar graph. The bars should have equal widths. In this case, they're intervals of four, and they should touch but not overlap. That is also a difference between a bar graph and a histogram. So let's try and create one on our own. Now let's create our own histogram. The data set lists the heights of the Houston Rocket players during the 2011-2012 basketball season. The heights are indicated in the box on your screen. First, we're gonna create a frequency table. Take a look at the frequency table on the screen. We have a title labeled players heights. We have height in inches that is already divided into intervals. And then we have a column that's titled frequency. So in order to create our frequency table, we're going to use tally marks. Let's look at 81 as an example. 81 falls in the interval of 80 to 84. So we are going to create a tally mark right there. I'm going to say the numbers aloud and we're gonna create our frequency table as we go along. So we started with 81 and that's already in our table. Now we're gonna start at 80, 79, 72, 72, 78, 82, 80, 80, 76, 87, 65, 79, 82, 80, 79, 81, 71, and 77. So I've used all of the numbers given to me and I've created my frequency table. Now we're going to create our histogram. Our histogram has a title and the axes are already labeled as well as the intervals. So all I have to do is create, you know, sort of the, the bar graph image and model as long as the bars are touching and they're spaced the same, they're the same size. So 65 to 69 had a frequency of one, 70 to 74 had a frequency of three, 75 to 79 had a frequency of 6, 80 to 84 had a frequency of 8, and 85 to 89 had a frequency of 1. So your histogram should look similar to mine. If you're drawing freehand, your, the size of your bars might be a little off, and that's totally fine if you're drawing freehand. The last part is we're going to look at the range and the mode of the histogram. So in order to find the range of the mode of the histogram, we actually are going to refer back to the numbers at the box on the top. So the range is the largest number, take away the smallest number, and in this case we have 87, subtract 65 to give us 22. And the mode is going to be the number that occurs the most. So we see frequencies, but that's actually a little deceiving. So we have to go back to those numbers in the top and realize that the number that occurs the most is 80. And that's how you create a histogram and identify some components of measure of center or variability to describe our histogram.
Now it's time to show what you know about box plots and histograms. Make me proud. You've been working so hard already. So what did we learn this week? Let's reflect back to our objectives from the beginning of the lesson. Students will recognize a statistical question as one that anticipates variability in the data related to the question and accounts for it in the answers. The second objective was students will display and summarize numerical data in plots on dot plots and histograms. If you have any questions, concerns, or if you just want to tell your teacher that you rocked this lesson, please reach out to them on their Google Meets or during their virtual office hours. They would love to hear from you. Well, once again, that's it for this week's Math 6 BCPS TV, week of June 1st, with me, Miss Barr. See you later.